Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is the beginning of a new series beginning in April of 2020 entitled How to Interpret Scripture. That should be a very useful and uh, challenging group of lessons. This particular one is a lesson for April 4 of 2020 entitled The Uniqueness of the Bible. We'll see what that's all about. But as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow our heads now in recognition of all that you have done to try to direct us in the best possible way through your book, through your life when you were here on this earth. And now we ask that you will help us to better understand it as we discuss together as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, there's many things that could be said about the Bible, but we're going to look at some general things really quickly first. Our Bible study guide says, composed of 66 books, written over 1,500 years on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, by more than 40 authors, the Bible is unique. There is no other book, sacred or religious, like it. And no wonder, after all, it is the Word of God. There are more than 24,600 New Testament manuscripts from the first four centuries after Christ. Of Plato's original manuscripts, there are seven. Herodotus, eight. And Homer's Iliad, slightly more, with 263 surviving copies. Hence, we have powerful confirmation, confirming, I'm sorry, confirming evidence of the integrity of the New Testament text. So my first question I'm going to ask you is, why is that a confirming evidence of the, new, the integrity of the New Testament text? Why? Well, well why there, would there be? Go ahead. There are why several there? copies from different times, oh, and they're sure. similar, not all exactly the same, yeah. but so, slight translation the, errors, the, slight the, copying the, errors. Yeah, the question we would have to ask is why are there 24,600 New Testament manuscripts and there's so few of these other famous ancient documents? Well, that's a lot. I just have never heard that before. Yeah. How about the Old Testament? The Old Anyone Testament. numbered those? Yeah, Total? but they're not nearly, not nearly, nearly, nearly as many of, of documents. But uh, the, the, the study of the New Testament is very different than the study of the Old Testament because fairly early in the history of, well, after, after the New Testament, in, 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 after Jesus was here on this earth, the Old Testament people began a very rigorous method of copying so that there's, as we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Isaiah is almost exactly the same as the ones a thousand years later because they developed this very precise way of copying. So there aren't nearly as many variations. And there aren't as many copies. And the reason there aren't as many copies is the Jews... Huh? It's a big job. Well, it is a big job. <clears throat> but the Jews believe that, well, of course, they didn't have fancy ink and so forth like we have now. And so you, you're not allowed to touch the text in any way. But even so, rolling it up and unrolling it and so forth, eventually some of the text, some of the ink would be, or it was basically charcoal kind of stuff, would get rubbed off. And as soon as they saw it was deteriorating a little bit, they believed that it was time to copy it again and throw the old one away and burn it. Hmm. So that's what happened to the Old Testament. But that's not true of the New Testament. So there's many, many, many of these smaller copies. Some of them are just small pieces. Others are fairly complete copies of the New Testament. So. Why do you think? Because no one's answered the question. Why are there so many? Well, maybe people uh, copied parts of it to give away. Okay. To share the, the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Gospel Commission uh, would be one part of it. And uh, as opposed to Homer way back then, I don't know how many, th there was probably more oral uh, transmission of stuff as opposed to in the early yeah. Roman era, era there probably was more means of copying and uh, mm -hmm. dispersing well, through well, the churches. Okay, think about this for a moment. 
if you're a church and you're, you know, you're, you're under persecution, you're illegal, you know, the Roman government is trying to get rid of you, and you're trying to do everything you can to support the church and inspire people and so forth like this, how many books of the Bible would you like to have in hand? Well, Wouldn't you like to have as many as like, possible? Oh, yeah, yeah. They should have had it like I have it, all electronic. Yeah, yeah. sure, of course. And they would, what's that thing? Many versions. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, Dennis, you have something more there? Uh, this is from the Adult uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Mar uh, March 28th, Sabbath. The Bible was the first book known to be translated, the first book in the West published on the printing press, and the first book to be so widely distributed in so many languages that it can be read by 95% of the Earth's population today. Wow. And what about the other 5%? Yes. Old, yeah? I was going to say they're still translating some of the, some of the uh, offshoots of some of these languages. Yeah. Yeah, there's <clears throat> some places, uh, quite a bit in the Middle Eastern area, yeah. that uh, yeah, still need Bibles. The Bible is amazing in its content and its message. The same God who inspired the prophets and the apostles wrote the Bible uh, to write the Bible is still active in our day in the fulfillment of prophecies and the teachings of the Scripture. So it's amazing if you think about it. I mean, how many books do you have access not only to the written material and copies of different people made interpreted, but you have access to the original author? Yeah. So you have something about that, Margaret? Yeah, I have 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is, a footnote in the printed version, let's see, and is, what? Well, anyway. so there's, instead of saying all scripture is inspired by God, which is most, many visions do, they say an alternate translation is really more accurate. Every in scripture inspired by God is also an, so. Okay. So every scripture inspired by God is also useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. And this is from the Good News, by good news Translation. And then there is John 14, 16, and 17. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, who will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him because it cannot see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and is in you. And that's also from the Good News Bible. And then there is John 15, 26. Jesus said, the Helper will come, the Spirit who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father and he will speak about me. Another text from the Good News Bible. Okay, so what role has the Holy Spirit played in giving us the scriptures and in teaching us how to read them in modern times? Well, He's totally this, involved. Yeah, the total, the single biggest thing that the Holy Spirit has done for us is the giving of the Bible. If the Holy Spirit was the one who gave the messages to the prophets and thousands of years, thousands of years ago, wouldn't he be the best one to interpret to our minds today? Well, it's interesting, and I, we don't have time to read this whole chapter. Deuteronomy 32 has a lot of very interesting information, as you could guess if you think about it. That's two chapters from the end of Deuteronomy, and the last chapter is about Moses dying. So this is like Moses' last words to the people. In this lengthy passage, we see some of the very last words that Moses spoke, yes, and many of the principles that we need to learn even today are included in those words. It even speaks about God's anger, and it sounds initially like God is going to zap his people. But then we discover in Deuteronomy 32, 30, these words, the Lord their God had abandoned them, their mighty God had given them up. These are exactly the words used about Christ's crucifixion in Romans 4, 25. And what Jesus himself said is recorded in Matthew 27, 46. What did he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken or abandoned me? Imagine finding this description of God's anger so far back 
and biblical history. No wonder Moses felt compelled to make the strong recommendation to the people found in Deuteronomy 32, 45 to 47. Tim? When Moses had finished giving God's teachings to the people, he said, make sure you obey all these commands that I have given you today. Repeat them to your children so that they may faithfully obey all God's teachings. These teachings are not empty words. They are your very life. Obey them and you will live long in that land across the Jordan that you are about to occupy. Wow. By reviewing constantly the history of God's actions with his people here on this earth, it will bring us under the power of the Holy Spirit and even closer to him. And we know that at the end of time, a group of people who are totally committed to God and keeping his word faithfully will stand through the final events on this earth before the second coming. I think you have something on that also. Revelation 14, 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus from the Good News Bible. In the Gospel of John, the very first chapter, we read the sad story, a couple of verses in that chapter are the saddest in the whole Bible, of Jesus who came from heaven to reach his own family, his people here on this earth, and they rejected him. We, he became a human being and they still would not listen to him. Jesus came the first time and he will come back again. These comings are the focus of all of scripture. The Old Testament is focused largely on his coming the first time, and the New Testament is focused largely on his coming the second time. So why is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus such an important part of our hopes for the future? Well, that's one of the big issues that we're going to be talking about. So the Bible has come to us from a great variety of authors written in a variety of places by people under a huge variety of circumstances. Some messages were given to young people. Can you name someone who was given a message when he was very, you may be even a teenager? Well, Samuel. Samuel? Anybody else? David. 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 Wrote Psalms, yeah. Who else? We've just been studying. Daniel. Daniel, of course. Three worthies. Yeah, they exactly. When they... uh, Daniel, too. This was, he was probably, maybe he, had been, maybe he was 20 years old by that time. I don't know. Others? were given messages very, when they were very elderly. Can you name an example? Mm. Well, Isaiah would be from young to old. You know? Okay, who else? He, he would span quite a bit of time. Moses was pretty old when he wrote. Yes, who else? John, Revelation. John, very old when he wrote. And once again, Daniel. He was still writing when he was in his 90s. So this, God was using all kinds of people. Some people were slaves, others were rulers. Some were ordinary laborers, others were kings. Think of the stories of Jeremiah and Amos, Daniel, Jesus, and John. So why do you think God chose such a d diverse group of people over such a long period of time to write his book for him? I mean, couldn't he have just summarized it nicely in a fairly brief, concise, easy to read passage? Uh, you know, a few pages maybe, and just delivered it to us. Wouldn't that have been better? If you're talking just about information, I suppose, uh, you know, an instruction on how to build whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about God's interaction with people, someone who comes close to us and inter interacts uh, and and does things with the people mm -hmm. comes close you know on Sinai and the temple and uh, sanctuary. They didn't want him to come quite so close on Sinai. Right yeah. but that was the whole <laughs> that I may dwell amongst them yeah. you know so when he's um, it's a, a picture of action throughout yeah. time. So, so what we see what you're saying to us and I think this is the important point is God just didn't say, okay, here it is, now go with it. He said, watch me as I interact with people for hundreds of years, and you'll learn a lot more about me than just a simple text that someone might give us. Another point is he uh, interacted with a certain group of descendants, not people from every tribe and nation. Yeah. 
These are all his chosen people. He chose them, descendants of Abraham. I tend to think that God actually chose everyone mm -hmm. and tried to communicate with everyone. It's just the children of Abraham through Isaac are the ones that we have the record of and that responded more to him. Well, well, we have Jonah going to Nineveh to absolutely. evangelize uh, after uh, the incident where Elijah uh, hears the still small voice and he finally comes to his senses. He's sent to, to anoint uh, Elisha, but also up to Syria to uh, anoint some king up there. Yeah. Which you say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> I thought he would only be... With yeah. the, with Israel, mm -hmm. but but he's anointing a king in another land. So mm -hmm. it speaks that there may be a little bit more. You know, God will go where he he he's yeah. welcome or where he can. So let's think about that a little bit. I've heard pastors tell us, and I've said myself, the Bible is a letter from God to us. So if it's all this stuff going on in ancient times, hundreds, thousands of years ago, how can that be a letter to us? That seem nothing, right? Nothing it's, new under the no, sun. It's, it's, and it's a principles <laughs> mm -hmm. that are presented. Very good. That never change. Many of the Bible writers are first-hand witnesses of the events that they reported. Others gathered their information by careful research among those who were first-hand observers. And of course, um, I'm just going to read that from Luke chapter 1. Dear Theophilus, this is the beginning of Luke's gospel. Many people have done their best to write a report of the things that have taken place among us. They wrote we have, what we have been told by those who saw these things from the beginning and who proclaimed their messages. And so, Your Excellency, because I have carefully studied all these matters from their beginning, I thought it would be good to write an orderly account for you. So he doesn't say, I saw it myself. I carefully studied these things. I've Researched. talked to people mm -hmm. that uh, saw it and so forth, and now I'm going to tell you. So is that, um, is that a good thing? He did research, yes. Okay, Gordon? This is from the introduction to the Great Controversy, and it's also found in Selected Messages, both by Ellen White. God has been pleased to communicate his truth to the world by human agencies and he himself, by his Holy Spirit, qualified men and enabled them to do his work. He guided the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. <clears throat> the treasure was entrusted <coughs> excuse me. The treasure was entrusted to earthen vessels, yet it is none the less from heaven. Wow. Okay. One of the things that makes the Bible unique is the fact that a single author, God himself, inspired different people under different circumstances over such an incredible period of time to write a single message. No one else could have done it that way. One of the unique features of the Bible, we've talked about several of them now, is the fact that about 30, up to 30% of its content is in the form of prophecy or prophetic literature. Um, we have something about that. Amos 3, 7. Carrie? The Sovereign Lord never does anything without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. It comes from the Good News Bible. Do you, do you believe that? It's been 2,000 years since God has revealed anything, right? So we're sort of run out of revelation here or what? Ellen White was a prophet. Okay. Matthew 24, Jesus speaks uh, of things that are about to happen, the mm -hmm. destruction of Jerusalem, but also down to the uh, end, yeah. end of time. And then, of course, Revelation yep. uh, projects into the future when he comes. So let's look briefly at the Old Testament. There are many prophecies about the coming of Jesus, his life and his death, found in the Old Testament. One of the most obvious is found in Isaiah 53, which is a very familiar section to many of us. What does it, why does it say in Isaiah 53, 4, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God? 
all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. In what sense did Jesus suffer because of the evil we have done? These are, these are huge questions that we have all heard many sermons on, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to sort of put it in a few verses, but what, what is the typical, the typical understanding of why Jesus had to die? There are many people who believe that Jesus came here for one purpose only, and that was to die, because his blood is going to pay the price for our sins. He came here knowing that he would die, mm -hmm. but not for the purpose of dying, but the purpose of his death was to show God's righteousness, Romans 3.25. But I thought <clears throat> God's wrath was poured out on him. Well, God's wrath is described as letting you do whatever you choose to do mm -hmm. in Romans 1 and, and uh, other places. So, Well, in a sense, it, he gave Jesus over to Satan's control. Mm-hmm. And, and Satan Why would he need to do that? I think there are a lot of things that we won't understand until uh, we're in the kingdom. We mm -hmm. can try to understand them, but if uh, we think, you know, if we're going to study this throughout the end of the ages of eternity, yeah. why do we think that we can wrap it up nice, nice and neat here and now? Well, I, uh, I have a funny way of, not funny way, I, I I, I, a thought-provoking way, in my opinion, how to sort of summarize that, and that is the life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. We can choose to live a life like he lived, or we will die the kind of death he died. So there it is. It's spread out before us. We can choose what we want. Yeah, I think if we focus on what it is we can do in response rather than trying to figure out what's under the hood and how this all comes about, you know, because like with driving a car, mm -hmm. that's a certain skill set, but I don't know how to put a car together mm -hmm. from scratch. I don't know how to repair modern cars. <laughs> mm. So there are, there are levels of knowledge that, that are just beyond what we know uh, or can know even now. But if mm -hmm. we stick more with, well, what, What's, uh, what does God want me to do? How can I relate to God and build faith? Because um, if we base it on knowledge, then we just get into infighting over what this mm -hmm. is or that is. Well, thinking about prophecies in the Old Testament, the birth of Jesus was predicted in Micah 5, 2. You remember that verse? The Lord says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are one of the smallest towns in Judah, but out of you I will bring a ruler for Israel, whose family line goes back to ancient times. Why does he say that? He's talking to descendants of David, and he says, but this descendant of yours is going to have a family line that goes way back somewhere. Talking about Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And on his mother's side, how old was he? Well, 32. 30, yeah. Who, uh, went up to 31 or 32, or three, 33 maybe. On his father's side, how old was he? Older than time. <laughs> Older than time, yeah. okay. Well, the beginning of his ministry was predicted, as was his death, three and one half years later, in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. His coming to Jerusalem in the form of a king, riding humbly on a donkey, the colt of a donkey, was prophesied in Zechariah 9, 9. There are at least 65 direct messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. If we add all the types looking forward to the Messiah, then there are many more prophecies. For example, the lamb that's being sacrificed and all the, all the <coughs> activities going on in the temple that point forward to, to Jesus. We're even told that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Remember Jacob's prophecy about his sons way back in Genesis 49. But the fact that there are so many prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament is mirrored by the fact that Jesus himself often pointed out that the events of his life were the fulfillment of prophecies. And if we had time, we would read from Luke 9, 21 and 22, Matthew 17, 22 to 23 and 24, 1 and 2, and even John 14, 1 to 3. Of course, in reviewing all these prophecies and their fulfillments, 
we need to think about why Jesus had to die. This is the most important question in the Bible, in, in my opinion. The purpose of the life and death of Jesus was not just to pay some price that God demanded before he would save sinners. Jesus came and lived and died to demonstrate the truth to us about God himself. In order to do this, he had to directly refute through his life and his teachings the many, misrep many misrepresentations and lies from Satan. And I think, Jim, you have something on that. The Bible is unique when compared to other, quotes, holy books because it is, it is constituted in history. This means that the Bible is not merely the philosophical thoughts of a human being, for example, like F Confucius or Buddha, but it records God's acts in history as they progress toward a specific goal. In the case of the Bible, those goals are, number one, the promise of a Messiah, and number two, the second coming of Jesus. This progression is unique to the Judeo-Christian faith, in contrast to the cyclical view of many other world religions from the ancient Egypt to modern Eastern religions. That's from the Adult Bibles, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. One of the most amazing things about the resurrection of Jesus is that we are promised that if we are faithful, we can experience that same thing ourselves. And of course, there's a lot about that in 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 8, 11, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, and other, uh, many other places. There are some people who have claimed that there, there are as many as 200 references to the second coming in the New Testament. I don't know how they accounted all that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Not only did the life and death of Jesus fulfill prophecy from the Old Testament, but also the New Testament provides multiple eyewitness accounts of those events. Some of the same people who saw him die also saw him after he arose. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to ask you, who could, name two or three of them. All the disciples oh, yeah. that survived, yeah. that okay. is all but Judas. Mm -hmm. Mary oh, and Mary. Yeah. Paul took up this theme and made it very clear that if what we believe about the resurrection of Jesus is not true, then our hopes are vain and we are believing a lie. So now, stop and think for a moment about the people who saw Jesus die on the cross and then two days later saw him alive. Try, try to think how that would impact you. You blink a couple of times and you wipe your eyes. <laughs> what? Well, when Mary told the disciples... Yeah. They didn't believe her. No. Nope. On the road to Emmaus, you know, the two guys were walking along talking about joined up by a third. That must have <laughs> stuck with them the rest of, their, the rest of their lives. That could have been a man and his wife. Could have been. Yes, could be. We weren't there, but the account was pretty interesting. It's amazing, you know. <laughs> I just, every time I read that story in Luke 24, let's look, look just look at a couple of those verses. Um, I'm going to read from, we should start with, um, no, there it is. Start really, as they talked in dust, these two men who are walking along, we're looking at Luke 24, starting with verse 15. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow did not recognize him. Do you think God was playing hide and go seek here? Well, they didn't expect to see him, so they no. didn't recognize him. Well, they knew he was they, dead. They, they knew he was yeah. dead. Jesus said, well, Jesus said to them, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? And he doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> these, these, I just love this passage. They stood still with sad faces. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know what the things that have been happening there in these last few days? Jesus must have been, I mean, how could he keep from smiling? <laughs> what things? <laughs> what things, he's asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. And you know the rest of the story. But this I just, man was a prophet. Yeah. I, every time I get a chance, I have to read that passage. I just love those words. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead and appeared as a human being to the disciples on several occasions is proof that God has the ability to raise us even if we sleep in the grave. 
if we did not have this promise, we would be no better than the atheists who believe they will die and stay dead forever. There are several occasions recorded in Scripture when the teachings of the Scriptures had been lost sight of for some period of time, and then, when rediscovered, led to a real reformation. Can you think of some? Well, one of the obvious ones that we could talk about here is found in 2 Kings 22, the, the, most of that chapter, verses 3 through 20. And do you remember what happened? Josiah was a king who became, he became king when he was eight years old. He obviously had to have a lot of guidance and care at that point in time. When he got to be somewhere around 20 or early 20, somewhere in there, I don't remember the exact age, but he was still very young. He decided that the time had come for them to clean up the temple. It had fallen into disuse and apparently had a lot of junk there and so forth. And he said, repair it, fix it, clean it up. And what happened? They found the scripture. They the found a scroll, at least one scroll in there. And many scholars have looked at that and suspected that it might have been a scroll of the book Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. And what happened then? Reformation. Well, Reform he had it read out loud to yeah. the people. Yeah, well, first of all, the scholars read it, and then they took it to the king, and they read it to him, and he tore his clothes. He said, oh, help me. What have we done? How have we got to be this fearful and awful mess that we're in now when we had this kind of instruction hundreds of years ago? So then he set about, Josh, I mean Josiah, set about to go all through the country and absolutely destroy any efforts, any, any process of worshiping these pagan gods, these fertility gods, etc. Well, they began cleaning up the, th they began with cleaning up the temple itself. What an incredible response to the reading of the Bible. What do you think would happen if a portion of scripture were read aloud on a downtown street in a major city in our world today? Probably. They would anyone even pay attention? <laughs> Depends where and how often you're there. They might be avoided. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a place in London called the Hyde Park Corner yep. where people can stand up on a soapbox and preach anything they want. Hmm. And sometimes they get people gather around and, and listen, but... Uh, I have a place yeah. like that in Sydney. Yeah. One of my customers, I had to get him out of jail after he tangled with the police. <laughs> <laughs> You're very special customers from the... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, one of the most amazing proofs of the uniqueness of the Bible is its ability to transform lives even in our day. And let's give a couple of passages to document that. John 16, 13, the words of Jesus, When, however, the Spirit comes who reveals the truth about God, He will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak of in his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. And again, it's important to notice the to come because so many so-called scholars don't believe that even God can predict the future. And then we read from Romans 12, 2, the words of Paul this time, Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him, and is perfect. Wow. So, in order to be effective, the Bible must be read and understood individually by each one of us. It's not enough to accept the teachings of some spiritual leader, no matter how gifted that person may seem to be. <clears throat> Terrible times are coming ahead of us. Dennis, I think you have something on that. Here's a couple passages here, uh, both on uh, 593 of Great Controversy. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. Okay, Dennis, I'm going to interrupt there. That's Great Controversy, of course, 593, the first paragraph. What do you think that means? How can we, how can we, the devil is going to get, his, his, his 
campaign is going to come up with something that's so close to the scriptures that we have to be very cautious to distinguish between what's true and what's false? Exactly. Is wow. it talking about that he will try to um, impersonate Christ's coming, second coming? Well, that's one of the possibilities. But we, we need, the time for deceit is before that. Um, How's he going to convince people? I mean, most of the people in the world today, the, in our part of the world anyway, don't seem to care much at all about religion. Many of them anyway. Uh, how, how, how is God going to wake them up and say, hey, you need to pay attention here? Any idea? Okay. When, well, when trouble comes, yeah. yeah. This morning, standing on the green, I've never seen it happen. Gathered all the men's club together. You got 60 guys. And the president asked one of the men to pray. I've never seen that happen. Wow. You know what happened to get their attention? Next door neighbor of Ed diagnosed this week with two forms of cancer, one of mm. them brain cancer. Mm. And you mm. should have heard the prayer that Jerry prayed. Mm. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. But trouble comes, and then some people turn. It's like 9-11. Yeah. You know, for about a week, everybody was getting... Religious. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a week later, you couldn't uh, hard to remember it. But, There's a uh, certain readiness mm -hmm. when something bad happens. Yeah. Nothing like a hurricane or earthquake or tornado to have us talk about God for a few minutes. Yeah. And from Staten's side, I think all he has to do is tell people what they want to hear. If okay. they want to... <clears throat> to have their will, their desires satisfied, then he will give them pleasing pieces of information that might support that. Okay. Go ahead, read your next so, passage there. Uh, None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. To every soul it will come to the, uh, will come the searching test. Shall I obey God rather than man? The decisive hour is even now at hand. At our feet planted on the rock of God's immu are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word. Are we prepared to stand firm in defense of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? 593 again going on to 594. So what should be our response in that kind of a situation? Margaret? It it is the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the scriptures what is truth and then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow his example. We should day by day study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought and comparing scripture with scripture. With divine help, we are to form our opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. And that's from the Great Controversy, page 598, paragraph 2. So what do you think God actually has in mind for us? A couple of wonderful paragraphs from Desire of Ages, 664, second one from 668. He came to the world to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. Okay, so let's talk about that for a moment. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. God was manifested in him that he might be manifested in them. So this, what does that sentence mean? God appeared working through Jesus that he, is that Jesus or is that God, might be manifested in, in the disciples? Probably both. Yeah, uh -huh. I'd say both. We both. see the light of the glory of God in the face of, of Jesus Christ. Deeper. And it's, uh, by beholding, we become changed. Mm -hmm. uh, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. 
okay. them as the people that choose yeah. to follow, choose okay. to listen. So what does it mean when it says, Jesus exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him? How many miracles have you been doing recently? <laughs> Don't everybody well, talk at once. You have to measure it by miracles? Well, I, I just, it, it says he exercised no powers, and so I'm just asking. Maybe more, it's more of a character development. We tend to okay. have, we want to be like him. We try to develop Likely we a, don't have like, enough faith. <laughs> a character like his. Well, I, th I think one of the important points is to recognize is that what God is trying to say to us through Ellen White here is that the things that Christ did took place, his, the so-called miracles, etc., happened because the night before he was in prayer with his father and they planned out every single day. I'm sure that's true. And Jesus did not perform those miracles in his own power. He, if, 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 if he had done things with his, in his own power, miraculous kind of stuff, the Satan, Satan would have cried foul. He said, mm -hmm. you can't claim that you're a human being when you're exercising divine power. So Jesus exercised, he performed all those miracles, not on his own, but he followed exactly what God, the Father told him to do, and then God exercised his power through him. That's the only way I can understand this kind of language. Uh, is someone going to argue with me? No, but I, I think we have, uh, have to be in subjection, as it says, to God as he was. In other yeah. words, he, uh, he didn't do anything unless... God told him to do it. He mm -hmm. didn't speak anything unless God told him to speak it. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a relationship that uh, that we can desire to have, but it requires uh, the submission of our own will to God and a little to, tough. to seek seek after those that kind of experience. The, uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God which shall abide out under the shadow of the Almighty. So, uh, closest communion, Ellen White says, is that um, um, shelter of mm -hmm. the Most High God. Okay, Jim, I think you have another paragraph that's even more startling. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, He will so identify Himself with our thoughts and aims so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will that when obeying him we shall be but carrying out our own impulses the will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service when we know god as it is our privilege to know him our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of Christ through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Page 668. Wow. Wow, wow. Just, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a thing to think about or two, huh? So how do you suppose that happens? Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. How does that happen? we become like what we worship. Mm -hmm. If we worship God, we become more like him. If we mm -hmm. worship Satan, we become more like him. Mm -hmm. What we behold and what the Spirit tries to teach us is that people are valuable, that they're uh, not to be used by us, but in God's eyes for uh, for lifting them out of the, uh, the muck and mire of this si uh, sinful world. Mm -hmm. um, but we um, uh, tend to look at people in terms of what we can get out of them or what they are to us, uh, either mm -hmm. for good or ill, but we need to be able to rise above that so that okay. God can give us a compassion and a love for uh, those who are lost. and. Gordon, I think you have some additional material from that same chapter in Desire of Ages. Uh, just a couple pages further from Desire of Ages. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, 
who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. Okay. <clears throat> And then in the next paragraph, the very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. I have looked at that and tried to think about that paragraph for a, a number of hours. And I think what she, Ellen White is trying to tell us here is that God said back in the beginning, people who really love me and really want to do my will can live godlike lives. And Satan and his response said, no, nobody can do that. Well, God sent, just wait, he sent his son down, and Jesus lives his entire life without sinning even once. And Satan's response would be, well, yeah, but he wasn't an ordinary human being. He was a very special situation. God says, well, wait, at the very worst time in human history, I'm going to have a group, have a group of people who will stand for me, love me, and do my will no matter what. Nothing Satan can do to them will prevent them from doing that. And Satan says, impossible, not going to happen. And God says, just wait. Hmm. So God has said it's going to happen. We'll find out. So why do you think so many people have been willing to live their lives, even to die a martyr's death, because of what they have learned from the Bible? Will we stand faithful for the truth and even be willing to die, if necessary, for what we have come to understand from Scripture? Well, what does it say in was it Philippians? Was it two? Let this mind be in you, as in Christ Jesus. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's totally other-centered, no self-centeredness in that. Yeah. One of the most compelling reasons for believing the Scripture is God's ability to create out of nothing and thus his ability to recreate us when the time comes. He also has the ability to predict the future far in advance. These two arguments are spelled out in some deal, detail, and I might add repeatedly, in Isaiah 40-55. Mm -hmm. And if you get a chance, we would challenge you out there to gander, look, look through those chapters and just realize. And I would, I would encourage you to do it in several different versions if you can. And realize what, what Isaiah says about how you identify a true God. If in that, fact... That point about God creating and being able to recreate mm -hmm. is, is a point that uh, a lot of us don't appreciate I, I didn't for some time, and, you know, if he can recreate us in the earth made new, he could have created us at the beginning. If he created us at the beginning, he could, as I believe he did, and the Bible says he did, he can recreate us again. Yeah, I mean, those who believe somehow or other, even the, even the people who believe that, that human beings came about by some evolutionary process, but sort of guided by God, is he going to have to do that all over again at the point of resurrection? I mean, you know, what's going to be left of Adam who died who many thousands of years ago? God can't just put him back together again. He's got to start over, right? Well, if in fact we believe that the life... Yeah. He has a blueprint. He has a blueprint. Okay. <laughs> if in fact we believe that the life and death of Jesus are the high points of Scripture... Are we able to spell out in clear and distinct lines why Jesus had to die? We've asked that two or three times already. How many places in the New Testament can you think of where Jesus specifically mentions the fact that his life and his death would be a fulfillment of prophecies from the Old Testament? Well, there's a number of them. Um, and if you get our handout, you will find some of them listed there. The road to Emmaus, you already mentioned, and then once they... he. They, the two from Emmaus go back and talk to the people there. Then he, Jesus appears to 
uh, in the upper room and uh, opens the scriptures to them also. I, I, I think about that. The, you know, they, they, they came back from Emmaus. They came into this upper room and the disciples are still scared to death. They've got the door locked. I don't know what kind of a lock it had, but I'm sure they weren't welcoming strangers. And these guys must have knocked and tried to give some secret password and finally they Oh, okay, you come in quick, close the door. <laughs> and those guys are so excited. Yeah. <laughs> the other people are so despondent. Yeah, exactly. And then all contrast. of a sudden, boom, there's Jesus. And I, I, I try to imagine, I, I mean, would you just faint dead away if you saw something? Like what, where did you come from? So yeah. why don't we have the arguments or the, the explanation that Jesus gave <clears throat> of that was so convincing mm -hmm. from the Old Testament. Why don't we have that explicitly listed in the Bible? You like a recording. Yeah, that would be good. Not only really that's not done there, and then and Jesus never explained what the efficacy of his death was going to be. Uh -huh. He never says, hey, "I die for, and you're going to all be paid up." It's not there. Uh -huh. Yeah. You only you only can get close with what the purpose of the death was, is with Paul in Romans 3.25. And, and 26, of course, don't, don't leave that out, but uh, they, most of the translations have messed up Romans 3.25. And I suspect <clears throat> that some of the arguments that Jesus used or some of the points that Jesus brought up on the road to Emmaus was what the disciples used in subsequent sermons, the disciples yeah, and Stephen many times. And, and others. Yeah. Okay, Gordon, I think. Carrie. Oh, it's Carrie. I'm sorry. Let us begin to summarize. A number of important elements make the Bible unique when compared to other religious books. Four elements in particular stand out in stark contrast to the philosophical and esoteric thoughts of the likes of Confucius, the Quran, and the Hindu sacred writings. One, the Bible comprises up to 30% prophecy and prophecy rather, and prophetic literature. Two, the Bible is constituted in history. That is, it speaks of a God who acts in history. Three, the Bible events are placed in a spatial dimension of real geographical places. And four, the Bible has the power to transform lives because of the God who speaks to us through his living word. Is it any wonder then that for centuries it has inspired the greatest works of music, art, and literature? This week we will study why the Bible is unique and unrivaled and remains so, even with the fast growth of technology and knowledge in the 21st century. And this comes from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide 13. We live in a world full of audio-visual materials intended to continually distract us. Billboards, etc. What, what are they there for? To grab our attention, right? Mm -hmm. How can we set aside these distractions when it comes time to study Scripture and to study God's Word? How much time do we spend doing so many other things in comparison with how much time we spend studying the Scriptures? These are questions I'd like to ask you out there. I wish you could respond. Commit ourselves to putting the Bi studying the Bible first before you get distracted with email and Facebook yeah. and everything else. That's the first thing I do every morning. Get my runner's clothes on. I'm headed out running my trails and listening to inspired material. One of the things that makes the Bible so believable is the story-like nature of the text. Many specific geographical locations are mentioned in almost every part of the Bible. Many of these locations, one, have been discovered, two, have been excavated, three, are known to fit the biblical story. There are more specific geographical locations mentioned in the first 20 chapters of Genesis than there are in the entire Koran. All of these things help to make the Bible seem and be very real. One example is the town of Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means the house of bread. There, Ruth met Boaz, got married, and had a son named Obed. That son was the father of Jesse and the grandfather of? King David. King David. 
David would establish a dynasty which will continue forever. There, the one we know as the bread of life was born. Notice how a chain of biblical places such as Bethlehem tie the stories together. Modern archaeology also has demonstrated the proof of even many of the stories in the Old Testament. Josiah went about to cleanse the land of the worship of pagan deities. We've already talked about that. We, can now, we now can dig up the remains of some of those very temples that were probably destroyed by Josiah and his associates in his day. So how do all these facts help to confirm your trust in Scripture? Are you sure that the prophecies in the Bible about upcoming events in the last days can be relied upon based on previously fulfilled prophecies in Scripture? Yeah. I mean, how many prophecies are there in the Bible? Many of them. Many of them are conditional. What do we do with conditional prophecies? Do they help us at all? If God says, if you do this, this is what will happen, and later we see what? They did that and... and that happened. That, <laughs> I mean, that, that ought to teach you something, right? God wants to transform his people into Christians who are Christians truly in name and deed. Christians, remember, are people who are Christ-like. In a small way, could we actually come to be like Jesus himself through a careful study of the Bible under the guidance and transforming power of the Holy Spirit? God is offering his help. He's saying, you have, as Gordon already pointed out to us, these computers can have hundreds of materials. Mine has, I probably have 150 different versions of the Bible or something like right here in, in, in this tiny little computer, plus all kinds, all the writings of Alan White and all other different kinds of comments that people have made. I, in, I could go on for years probably just studying what's in my computer here. And yet, we w that would be just the beginning. There's so many things that aren't in here. And yet, we have all this evidence about God. It's evidence that we can test. It's evidence that proves that God is active in human history and that he has done the claims that he has done the things that he claimed he would do. And then what does that say to us about the future? If God says, I'm coming again, and this is what's going to happen before I come again, again, would that be a fair idea to say maybe we ought to pay attention? Yeah. I think it would be an excellent idea for us to pay attention. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these inspired materials that lead us to a, a greater challenge in our understanding of you. We wish that we could see, and we will someday, see the whole history from beginning to end and realize all that you have done to try to reach out to people and convince them of the truth. May we Take up that challenge now and speak to those that we are able to reach near us, people we associate with every day. Teach them something about you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.